So let's hear it again for Justin Huertas. So this last month or so, we have been exploring the concept of crossing thresholds. And we've explored the different kinds of crossing thresholds that we do, like um, getting married, or retiring, or moving from childhood to adulthood. Um, those are just some of the thresholds that we cross in our lives. And for those of you who have been sending in photos, I've asked you to, to notice doorways, right? As they symbolize uh, moving from one transition to another and to send those in. So thank you to those who are uh, sending those in. So what about crossing a threshold, though, into a new state of consciousness? You know, we have all kinds of thresholds that we're uh, crossing, but what about crossing into a new state of consciousness and what can push us over the edge? So for years we've been hearing, right, that we're in this new age, that, that the age of Aquarius is here and we're all going to awaken together. So where is it and how do we start to cross over into that? What kind of push do we need? Um, <clears throat> I was thinking about the book by Ken Kai's The Hundredth Monkey, and I did meet him back in the 80s and, and had lunch with him, and of course my first question to him was, is that a true story? And he said, no. And I was really disappointed about that. But I'm going to share that story with you anyway, because it does, <laughs> it does speak to where we're going uh, and, 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 and the concept of crossing a threshold together. So the story is that there were uh, monkeys on this island in Japan, and, and one of them picked up a sweet potato that they were eating and decided to wash it. And so in washing it, the other monkeys began to watch, and they began to mimic the washing until a whole new generation began to also wash the potatoes until all the, the whole island, uh, the monkeys on the whole island did this. And then the story goes that it wasn't just limited to this island, but it transferred to the other islands, even though uh, they never met or talked to each other. The symbology in this, in the metaphor in this, is that when we all reach a certain level of awareness and consciousness, it simply jumps, yeah? And the truth is, we don't really even need to, I mean, that's a great metaphor and I believe in it, and we also have the internet, right? So it's kind of like we've already jumped in consciousness in, in a certain way because we all have access to all of this information that's happening simultaneously around the world. So what would it take for us to cross the threshold into a new consciousness? Well, we've been talking a bit about Unity's fifth principle. Now, in a short review, our five principles are number one, God is omnipresent, omnipotent, and omniscient. There is nowhere we can be where God is not, and God is good. The second is that the Spirit of God indwells all beings, so we are all awakening to that presence that dwells within us. Our third teaching is the law of mind action, that the thoughts that we hold in mind produce after their kind, and we do this through our fourth teaching, which is through prayer and meditation, and releasing and letting go and affirming the good. So the fifth is, it's great to know all these things, it's wonderful to know all these things, but they actually don't mean anything unless we actually practice them, right? Unless we actually do them. And so that is the call that we are receiving today, is uh, moving forward, and it's what the Fillmore's founded unity on. They didn't just talk about prayer, they prayed. So as we study the teachings of Jesus, of Buddha, of other spiritual traditions, we see what they did and how it worked, and can we do it? So I love the Fillmore's because, um, again, because they experimented. And because we're a, a church that's been around for quite a long time, we have a lot of stuff in our ar archives. And one of the boxes that I found were original Unity magazines from like 1900, 1906, and they used to seal them, so you needed a knife to open them up, right? And um, one of the things that they were into at this, or into experimenting was this thing called a red card. So what they would do is they'd have these red, big red cards that they'd 
prey on them and put their energy in them. And then they would put them in the Unity magazines and you're supposed to pull it out and like if you had a headache, put it on your head, you know, or put it on your knee, whatever. So as, we're, oh, as I'm opening one of the old Unity magazines, there's a red card in there. I thought, wow, this is cool. There's a red card. And I happened to be teaching a prayer class. I said, anybody want a red card? You could take it home. You could try it out, put it on, you know, and they did and nothing happened, but hey. <laughs> <laughs> that's part of practicing and that's part of experimenting is, you know, you get to try these things out. And it's what I loved about ministerial school, our, our seminary experience, is that it wasn't uh, just talking and studying, it was doing. So again, we didn't talk about prayer, we prayed. We didn't talk about prosperity, we tithed. We didn't talk about affirmations, we practiced working with them. So we were embodying the teachings and trying them out. An example is um, when I was in my first year, I believe, I just didn't feel like I belonged there. I just thought, I don't think this is my path, I don't think this is for me. And I remember uh, being really upset and going to see the dean, who was Hypatia Hasbrook, who wrote the book about prayer. And I'm standing at her office in tears, and she's like, what's wrong? And I said, I just, I want to quit. I don't think I belong here. So she sat me down, and she wrote me out an affirmation, like she was a doctor writing a prescription. And basically, I don't remember what it said totally, but it was a whole page, basically, and it said, you're in your right place doing, doing your ministry and everything that you need is provided. Financially, uh, you have the support that you need and, you know, it was great. And then she handed it to me and she's like, here, I want you to read this like three times in the morning, three in the afternoon, three in the evening. Every time you get a chance, just read this. I thought, all right, I'll do it. And you know what? Things began to shift and change. I saw more clearly what my ministry was. Things started to happen for me that, that lined up. And so, so if you're experiencing struggles in your life right now, try writing uh, an affirmation about what it is you want manifested in your life. And the key to writing an, affirm an, an affirmative statement is keep it in present tense language. So if you're saying, I am going to be healthy and whole someday, guess what? Someday is going to be way out there and you will be healthy and whole someday, but call it forth today. And if you need help, ask me, ask Diane, ask James Tierney, ask one of the chaplains. They'd be happy to uh, help you sit down and do one of those writings. So again, Jesus was a way shower, and the Fillmores looked at what he did in his life and said, okay, so how can we do the same? So one of the things that Jesus did is he, he went away to the mountaintop frequently, Right? When you read scripture, it's like Jesus went away to a lonely place. Jesus went up to the mountaintop. Jesus got away from the crowd. So if someone with a consciousness as high as Jesus had to get away and go to a mountaintop, where do you think that leaves you and I? You know? So he's, he's speaking to that importance of taking time to be quiet, taking time to be alone, taking time to replenish and refresh oneself. Prosperity teachings can be found in the scripture, particularly in the feeding of the 5,000, right? When you look at the story, there are steps there that show us what to do when we're experiencing stress in our financial life. You know, they were out in the middle of nowhere. There's 5,000 people. They're hungry. And what does Jesus do? He says, sit down. Just sit down. And then what do we got? We got uh, five bread, two fish, Okay, that's what we've got. Let's give thanks for that. And then it increased. Now, whether it magically increased, probably what really happened is people were hiding stuff under their cloaks and they passed it around and so then it, it multiplied. So the steps are, when one is experiencing financial stress, sit down, take the crowds, take the thoughts that are, can be unruly and just sit down. And then look at what you do have. Right? Because what, what we have and what we are grateful for, giving thanks for it, increases. And we can move from there. Now, none of this is new because these teachings really have gone mainstream, have they not? And we heard it from Oprah, we hear it on, uh, you know, Joel Olstein. We hear it everywhere now. These teachings have pretty much gone mainstream. So, where are we in this? And I think for us, 
as students of new thought, it's to take these teachings deeper, right? So it's like, okay, we figured out the prosperity principles, more or less. We figured out the different, how to use an affirmation, more or less. But now how do we begin to shift consciousness? Because that's really uh, one of the keys that we need to, it's the next threshold, if you will. It's the next threshold that we need to cross. So I have invited Troy to be with us here today. He um, started the Seattle Peace Project last summer. Some, do you, any of you remember what that is? Or, okay, so he's going to tell us more about it. But it's based on the idea that if enough people meditate for peace, that the crime rate will drop, right? It was uh, the Maharishi Maharesh tried this experiment. And um, so we, we began it last year till September, and now it's starting up again in June. So rather than me talk about it, Troy, please come up, welcome him, please. Thank you, Reverend Karen. I was born between the assassination of uh, Martin Luther King and Robert Kennedy in 1968, and that was a crazy year. I think it was the year Martin Luther King said, if we don't make, if mankind must make an end to war, or war will make an end to mankind. And I've always felt that I carried a little bit of that, that time with me. As a kid, I always had this belief that I could end all war someday. And I, I still do believe that. And as I grew, grew older in college, I was in Taiwan in 1993 when I heard about that study in Washington, D.C. I was meditating on a mountaintop. And um, I always thought someone needs to do this again on a bigger scale and get every religion involved. But it wasn't until um, two years ago, 2016, I'd been a teacher for a while. My son has grown up enough and something just clicked and I had to take action. I felt like there was a mission coming down to me and I, I couldn't, it was never a question of saying no. I couldn't say no. And so Reverend Karen was the first to say yes. <laughs> Thank you, Reverend Karen. <laughs> Most people were suspicious about all this, but uh, Reverend Karen just within about a minute of talking to her, she said yes, definitely. And that was kind of how I felt about it, was like, it was coming down to me and I couldn't say no. So last year we had about 20 groups involved, this year we're up to 33 as of now. Some are doing more, some are doing less, but we're doing all we can to get more. I made an app last year, if anyone remembers, um, to record your times of meditation and prayer. And it's even easier now. You just one click. Uh, it goes to a Google form now. It's in the cloud. So you don't have to worry about compatibility issues. It's extremely simple to use. But I've learned that as important as the technology is for doing this project, it's really the low-tech solutions that are the most essential. It's the person-to-person -person contact is all that really works. Because the magic is in you. It's in everybody out there who's just separated right now. And all you have to do is get people together, and then they have these amazing conversations and amazing friendships result. So I realized I need to bring people from all these different religious groups together and then make a critical mass of people power. So last year I realized I needed to do two things that I hadn't been doing. One is I created this... Um, this uh, meeting called the Peace Circle. So I've been to, I've had the privilege of being to dozens and dozens of churches and temples and to see what they do there. And people have these amazing spiritual teachings that they can access by sitting down and listening. But almost never, except in a few home groups, almost never do people have the opportunity to sit in small groups and open up their hearts and share with each other about their inner spiritual life and become each other's teacher. And I think that's something that everyone should do once a month. So after much trial and error over decades of practice with you know, meditation groups, I designed this, it's about a one hour program for three to seven people ideally, uh, where you go around the circle the first time you share without being interrupted, answer the question, what is the main thing this month that's preventing you from being as spiritually perfect as possible within yourself? And what are you doing about it? What practice are you working on? How's it going for you? Everyone listens carefully as you go around. Everyone gets a chance to talk. Second time around the circle, you bring forth some inspiring gem of wisdom. You tell a story, talk about a thing or a person that inspires you when you feel you need inspiration. And then the third time, you just thank each other for what they gave you that time. Simple, but we almost never do this kind of thing because our busy lives 
keep us busy all the time and not doing this. So it's a way to force yourself into a situation where you feel comfortable doing this. And after you do this with people, you, you understand them better, you can form deeper friendships, and it keeps you on a spiritual plane all month because you know you're going to be accountable talking to people about what you did and what you thought and whether or not you got angry. You have a little check-in. So uh, I've been doing this at four different places that are supporters of the group, the, the project. And um, we're going to start it here once a month. Uh, so we'll, we'll be next Sunday. If you can attend, please try to come by 8.30 a.m. in the chapel. We'll be doing it. That way we get done in plenty of time before the service. Okay, the other thing we're doing is uh, potlucks. We're trying to get all the different groups all over Seattle to articulate with each other. So you can meet the folks from all the other unities and all the other temples and churches and gurdwaras and everything else that's supporting us. If we'll bring them all together. So we've done it twice. The third potluck was going to be, it's going to be uh, on Saturday, May 12th at Genesis Spiritual Center in Burien. And we're going to keep rotating the venue. But uh, please try to come if you can. Mark your calendar, May 12th, Saturday. Um, and there's also a wellness workshop. And kind of like with a little peace circle, everyone has to bring a dish to eat. And you have to bring a story to tell. So it's actually quite fun. Uh, last time we did it, someone didn't, he, he thought, his wife told a story. So he said, one per family is good enough. And, and everyone was saying, no, you have to tell a story. Just like we were little kids or something. But it was fun. And the stories are good. And... Next month is a special month for me also, so please come to help me celebrate my 50th birthday. I'm crossing into my wisdom years, as I see it, halfway to 100. And I'm thinking a lot about what kind of legacy I want to leave. I think we owe it to the next generation to leave a better world than we're leaving. I still believe I can achieve world peace. I believe that we really are doing something right now that's at the beginning of a new age of peace. And I think the window of opportunity is still open a little bit. It's my chance. It's all of our chance, really, to make a difference. But we have to act with urgency. So I think we can come together to make an interfaith community that's stronger than anything ever before in the world. We can create this wave of pov positive energy that will actually reduce the crime rate. We can inspire cities everywhere to follow our example. I don't think any city in the world is as suited for this as Seattle. It has to begin here. It has to begin now. So please join me in the project because I really need your help. And I'll be here after the service. You can, you can see me to talk more about the details. Please do try to come join our Peace Circle at 8.30 next Sunday morning. And we'll do it monthly after that. Please try to come May 12th to the potluck. And every time after that, let's make a community, an interfaith community that spreads all Seattle wide. Uh, there's a pledge sheet. Also, you can sign up for how much time you want to pray or meditate for peace throughout the summer. I'm going to pledge 30 minutes a day, this time from June 1st to September 30th. Please, everybody, let's make history, and let's have a ball doing it. Thank you. So what Troy is doing is speaking to the fifth step, right? The fifth principle, which is putting action in, uh, in our beliefs and in our spiritual principles. And this is one way that we can do that. I was uh, reading Brene Brown's book this week, uh, Braving the Wilderness. And in it, she speaks to the importance of community, that, um, that gathering in an assembly uh, has uh, positive effects that last long before, long after we leave. So going to a concert, going to a ball game, going to a play, coming to church, that those experiences are actually profound and are an antidote to loneliness. Um, there's researchers who have been studying people coming together in, uh, they call them in, in assembly, and they found that these experiences contribute to a life filled with a sense of social connection and a decreased sense of loneliness. Um, it's an opportunity to feel connected and at peace. So, you know, the next time you're at a ball game, you're not going there just to distract yourself or, you know, to, to root for the Mariners. Yes, you are, but you're also going there to connect with a larger uh, group, are you not? I know when I go to the Wrigley Field, I don't really care if anybody goes with me. I invite people, but if they don't come, I still go. And I have a great time because I'm there to connect with, with the collective, with the, with the assembly that's there, and to feel that energy and to move forward with that. So... 
We saw this week uh, lots of symbolism regarding crossing thresholds and borders in, in Korea this week, did we not? I don't know how many of you saw the images. They were quite profound. CNN said that on Friday, Kim Jong-un became the first North Korean leader to step foot into South Korean territory since the end of the fighting in the Korean War in 1953. Um, now, I know Kim Jong-un has quite a reputation, right? And it's only, you know, he's been uh, launching missiles and not good to his people, and there's a lot. And those images were pretty powerful, and I'm a sucker, so I'm like, yes, I think with this, we could change this, and this, this, this is going to be uh, the start of something new. And it was so profound because... Uh, Moon was on the south side of the border, and then he crossed over to meet Kim, Kim as, so they could handshake and be photographed. Now, the border is like this, it's about a couple inches tall, concrete, and so one of, they each stood on one side of it, and then they shook hands, and then uh, Kim Jong-un just crossed over. He stepped over it and then they shook hands, and then uh, apparently they said, you know, that you should come over to the other side sometime, and he goes, well, why not now? And so they held hands, and then they, they both stepped over to the other side. And it was just so powerful to see these enemies, and this, you know, it's been a, a source, particularly with Kim Jong-un, of, of, of terror, you know, like, what's, what's going to happen next, and what's he going to do next, and then here is this movement of, of just stepping over the borders together, and holding hands, and hugging, and it was like, okay, really, and <laughs> Kim Jong-un later said in a, in a, in a um, broadcast that they were doing, he said, as I walked over here, I thought, why did it take so long, and why was it so difficult to get here? He signed the guest book, and he said, a new history begins now and an age of peace at the starting point of history. Together they planted a tree to symbolize their coming together. And then to further uh, go off with the images of borders and thresholds, they walked over a bridge together, a footbridge that was uh, past a sign indicating the military demarcation line. They announced their intention to seek the formal end of the Korean War. And uh, Moon said, there will not be any more war on the Korean Peninsula. The new era of peace has finally opened. We are not a people that should be confronting each other. We are the same people that should live in unity. We have long awaited for this moment to happen. So. Granted, we have the symbols, we have this incredible visual of them crossing over borders, holding hands, uh, shaking hands, uh, hugging, and now the real work begins, does it not? But it felt like this major shift. It's kind of like when the Berlin Wall came down. It's like, boom, there it was. It was over. It was like, really? All this time, and then boom, it's over? And is it possible that, that this two now is over, and if so, there's a change in the consciousness, isn't there? There's a shift in the consciousness. It's the hundredth monkey, whether it exists or not. In, in, in reality, it's that shift in consciousness that's happening. So crossing the threshold to peace can happen in a moment, and when enough of us raise our consciousness, a shift happens, and it begins by that fifth principle in unity. We know all the mysteries of the universe. We have them at our fingertips, but now we need to practice and put them into action. One way is by joining Troy and experimenting with him. So let's close with a prayer and bringing this into... into God bless you. So let's just take a deep breath. <laughs> crossing the threshold. Crossing the threshold into a new consciousness and a new awareness. A shift 
can happen at any moment. And as each one of us practices our prayer, our meditation, our deep conversation, our coming together in communal assembly, whether it be in church or a ballpark, we are lifted together. We are connected together. So I invite you to bring your awareness to the person who is sitting next to you, whether you know them or not. Just imagine that there is this light that is emanating from you because it's true and see it enveloping the person near you, next to you and extend it forward to the person in front of you and behind you. So that light swirls and fills this entire room and it is from here that it, it goes out. So as we go forward, may we all be lifted, knowing that as we are lifted up, we draw all beings with us. And it is for this awareness, and in the name and through the power of the living spirit of truth, that we say thank you and amen. Amen.